Let's bring on Lauren Southern. She's a Canadian. I I, I don't know how she became so intelligent uh, and insightful of being a Canadian, but she did. She wrote the book Barbarians, How Baby Boomers, Immigrants, and Islam Screwed My Generation. Uh, she rose to fame first at Rebel Media with, uh, I'm, I'm on there. They interview me all the time, there's Rebel Media. Ezra um, Levant, yeah. Uh, and... Uh, uh, she is now, she even ran for office. She's done all these kind of pranks where she uh, has gone on to, to uh, f what, what did she do? She went to a feminist march and declared herself, she had herself declared a man. That's what she did. Yes, I'm sorry. She always puts all, all these things up, why she's not a feminist and all this stuff. She was in England shooting a documentary, Fortress City, about the changing face of London since mass terrorism. Let's play the interview. Lauren, thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. So... Let's let's just start with you because I'm always interested in the journey that people take to get to a, a place where they are basically at war with the mainstream. I mean, whenever you take the positions you've taken, it's going to get you in trouble with the mainstream. So I'm always interested in how people got there. Did you start out as I'll, I'll call you a conservative? I know you're kind of a conservative libertarian. Did you start out there or did you have to take that trip? Well, I can thank where I am now to wonderful parenting. Unlike, I guess, unfortunately, a lot of millennials, when I got home from school every single day, my father would start the drive home by asking me what I learned. And instead of just saying, that's great, he would ask me questions to follow up. Oh, are you sure feminism is the best ideology? Are you sure that that's exactly what happened historically? And he gave me this nasty bug of uh, being forced to ask questions about everything. And it ended up getting me in a lot of trouble in school and university. I became the little devil's advocate in the class. And uh, being always being on the hot seat in the classroom, challenging the teachers kind of drove me to love being the devil's advocate and asking the tough questions, which is what got me in this situation now. So my dad can't complain about me running around no-go zones and getting myself in trouble since he caused this. He did this to me. <laughs> <laughs> Good, you can blame him. Now, you started out, you kind of were associated with the alt-right, which I know is kind of a loose phrase that people use. Right. But but you were, you were connected uh, to Milo and everything like that. So I... I, I do you consider yourself part of the alt-right? Well, here's the thing. It's it's funny. I, I won't label myself anything. I am what I am. But the alt-right rejects me because they don't think I, uh, I'm not a white nationalist, so I'm rejected by the alt-right in a lot of cases for that. But the alt-light also rejects me because I will have discussions about the importance of homogenous societies, and I will have discussions about how I do think that Germany should remain a majority German. I do think that my homeland, Denmark, should remain a majority Danish, right? So I'm kind of in this middle ground where I, I'm just willing to have logical d discussions, I think. And if that offends you and if that makes me a crazy Nazi, I'm not. But people will call me what they call me. <laughs> do you, have, you, have you broken? Are you still connected with Milo? Have you broken with him? Or is, are you still, do you still think he's kind of going in, in the right direction? I was just talking to him recently. He, I think he was just in London where I am and we were going to meet up for drinks, but he's quite busy. So uh, I haven't talked to him in a long time because he's very, th things, things went on a little roller coaster ride throughout his campus tour, of course, and his downfall and comeback. And uh, I, I more knew Milo before all of that happened, before his fame per se, where we were crashing Amber Rose slut walks together. Okay. Yeah, okay. I, I guess. I guess what I'm trying to ask. You wrote your book is called Barbarians: How Baby Boomers, Immigrants, and Islam Screwed My Generation. And obviously, the first thing that comes into a left winger's mind when he hears that is, "Oh, what a horrible racist you are, and how you hate immigrants and you hate Islam." Def defend yourself, Lauren. I mean, do you defend myself? Yes. Do you do you in fact hate people uh, for the color of their skin or for their religion? Well, you know, it's funny. I was actually having a debate with a left winger in a pub the other day, and they were just telling me, Lauren, all I want for society, all I want is for us to all get along. I just want people to live their daily lives uh, with the most fulfillment, the most happiness, and the most peace. And that's what I want as well. I want the highest amount of freedom with the highest amount of safety and peace and happiness. And the way you get that statistically, this has been shown in studies time and time again, is one with a homogenous society and a free society. And unfortunately, homogenous means you cannot have open borders because people do not assimilate fast enough. And homogenous also means you can't have this myth of multiculturalism. 
It's a myth. It hasn't worked everywhere it has been applied. Every time you see people with hardcore radical ideologies like Islam or even just really strong cultures, like we have a lot of Chinese coming to my hometown of Vancouver, they just don't assimilate. They don't talk to each other. They don't even do business with each other. Even if there's money on the line, I don't go into some towns anymore in British Columbia and Canada because people just won't talk to me because I speak English. And this is not something that is going to last. I mean, Justin Trudeau can say diversity is our strength over and over and over again, but as the face of the nation changes and people find that multiculturalism is really just segregated enclaves, that answer is not gonna be good enough for the young people who find themselves a English-speaking minority in certain places. It's not gonna be good enough for people who find themselves completely just disregarded by their communities because they are still beholden to a Western, <laughs> Western ideas. And it's just, it's not been working. It's been a complete and utter failure. This is something even people like Angela Merkel are starting to recognize and say, maybe we made a mistake here. Maybe things went too fast. So like many leftists, I want peace as well. I want happiness. I want things to work out fine and dandy. But we all know that that is a pipe dream unless you make some tough decisions to ensure uh, happiness. And that may not be for everyone, but it at least can be for some people within your borders. You know, it's it's interesting because it is a dilemma in countries like the European countries that are actually based on race. Germany is Germany because it's filled with Germans, French, uh, French because it's filled with Franks, and English because it's filled with Anglo-Saxon people. They actually have some argument for keeping a majority of, uh, of a certain race. Here in America, where we're based on a creed, we have a an argument for keeping our country a majority of one creed. It's entirely possible, as committed as I am to secular government and religious freedom, it's entirely possible that you can have a religion that is so antithetical to the American creed that we have to limit the number of people who can come in holding that that belief system. It's just, it's, it, it is a shame, but it's something that we have to look at. Um, one of the things that I'm really interested in, I've, I've watched a lot of your videos about feminism, one of them called Why I'm Not a Feminist, uh, one of them Why I'm Not Married, which I thought was kind of interesting too. And as an, as an old guy looking at, at younger people, I'm always kind of fascinated with this because it seems to me that feminism has so eaten away at the respect that was once paid to homemakers and mothers that I frequently hear young women making excuses for uh, the desire to become a homemaker, the desire to live a, a private life or, or to be a mother, and also using feminist terminology even as they reject feminism. So they say, I'm, I'm not a feminist because I believe you can be more equal by not being a feminist, where the question is, is equality even a goal? Um, so where are you now in this? I mean, are you still, would you still say you're not a feminist and why not? It's, it's funny. I, I'm definitely still not a feminist, but I think your point of people using feminist language to reject feminism is a fascinating one and asking, is equality the goal? Because that's another journey I've made since my rejection of feminism of saying, maybe me saying this is all about egalitarianism and total equality, and that's why I reject feminism, is still the wrong idea. Because women and men are not the same. That is just a fact. We have different brains. We have different wiring. We have different uh, things that make us happy, make us tick. And the, the reality is, is that in many different aspects of our lives, women and men are going to compete differently. They're going to react to things differently. In fact, I do a lot of research and even speeches on something like sexual market value. If women, for example, have sex with over 20 people, Harvard studies have shown that after that, there is almost a 0% chance of their marriage working later. They're almost 100% likely to get divorced once that number has reached 20 uh, 20. For men, completely different. So should we be approaching the genders as the exact same if our point is to achieve happiness for both these groups? The obvious answer when looking at the research is no, we need to approach them differently and realize that traditional lifestyles actually do lead to a lot more happiness for women because they react differently to things like sex. It's something that's very powerful and impactful to them. Also, they're just, quite frankly, not as happy in working jobs. If you've ever read, um, oh, The Coming Apart, Coming Apart. Coming Apart, uh, yeah, excellent. What, what, who's that by again? Oh, uh, Charles, uh, Charles, uh, Charles, uh, Charles uh, Murray, there we yeah, go. Charles Murray, there, the two of us yeah, working together. Have come up with, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
excellent points about how when polled, women show they are the happiest as homemakers. And as a young girl, when you've had so much Marxist propaganda, feminist propaganda, all of Hollywood telling you the best thing is to be a businesswoman or a lawyer or whatnot, that sounds great, but it's leading you down a path of sadness. And that's just statistically true. Women who reach 30 and are lawyers typically drop out of the field because it doesn't fulfill them or they can't compete. And as much as people may hate to admit that because we just have this god of egalitarianism, this god of equality, that we must reach it at all ends, even if it makes people miserable, uh, eventually it's going to get to this point where I think that actually the younger generation are watching women like myself and millennials and people like Miley Cyrus on their TVs just hit the stage of misery where there's no meaning to what a woman is. There's no meaning to femininity anymore. And they're just sad and lonely and don't have children or a family around them. And they're going to reject a lot of this and go back to kind of the traditional lifestyle. But it's really sad because a lot of this Marxist propaganda, the stuff you see in magazines, it's playing with people's lives. It's playing yeah. with women's happiness. And I, I, it may seem frivolous to just write an article about, oh, I'm perfectly happy being a lonely single woman in my 30s. It's <laughs> not, because you may actually convince a woman to go down that path. And it's going to be difficult for her to compete with 20-year-old women. She's not going to be able to find a good husband at that age. And she's going to be miserable, statistically speaking. And it's very, very sad. I've always thought the big mistake that feminism made was while attacking men, they basically attempt, uh, 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 they basically uh, took on male values of of work and right. of uh, f even of, of fame and of um, you know the kind of success that men uh, hunger after. They hunger after those things because it helps them find women. That's why. And and the, the, for women to take mm -hmm. those on, I think basically guts the true meaning of their life. That's the way it seems to me looking at it. But I'm not here to tell anybody how to live. What what happens when you look at you? Famously, you had a we went to a women's march with a sign that says "There's no such thing as rape culture." Uh, and which was taken away from you. When you're looking at the kind of the sex scandals that are going on here in America and everybody being, uh, you know, exposed as having chased women around the room and basically w women in Congress can't get into an elevator without getting attacked by congressmen. Do you think maybe you were wrong? Is there a rape culture? Well, we are certainly importing one when it comes to uh, immigration in Europe, but also within Hollywood. This is the thing. People don't, when it comes to normal society in the West, no, we do not. The majority of people reject rape. When you are proven to have raped someone, you go to jail. You cannot call that a rape culture. What I will say is that the elites play by a different set of rules. When you have enough money to hire all of the lawyers in the world to intimidate someone, to pay someone off, when you hold someone's career in the palm of your hand, their success, their failure, of course you're playing by a different set of rules than the average young man, young man on a college campus who will get accused of brushing a woman's arm and get kicked out of his school to the, to, in these days. Uh, so of course the Harvey Weinsteins of the world are playing by a completely different rule book than the average man. Uh, but I do think it's very interesting watching Hollywood just fall apart this way because we're learning a new lesson that every generation seems to have to learn. I swear our ancestors are just rolling in their grave and smacking their forehead <laughs> because we always forget how powerful sex is. Yeah. We always forget just how, how it much it impacts us psychologically, that Sodom and Gomorrah, all these different lessons throughout history that told us, no, this is a very impactful thing on more than just a one night stand for that however long it may be time period. That affects your mentality going forward. That affects your emotions. That affects, uh, people don't even see the obvious things these days like pregnancy and single motherhood, which are terrible for children to be in a single mother home. And I think we're really starting to get a grasp on how powerful sex is and why some of these traditional institutions like marriage and waiting for marriage and or at least just being with the person you love and not everyone, why we had these more traditional viewpoints and a taboo around sex because it's, it's something that impacts people for their whole lives. And like I was saying, the studies showing women failing in marriages later because of all the people they've been with, uh, we, we've really just thrown all these things to the wind and our generation is discovering the hard way why we had these traditions. No, no question about it. Um, you know, I, I, I'm running out of time, and I want to ask you, you have talked about, your book is called Barbarians, How Baby Boomers, Immigrants, and Islam Screwed My Generation, and you're actually in England uh, reporting on some of the stuff that's going on there. What are you doing in England? Well, I'm, I've been doing a bit of filming all around, but the biggest thing I'm working on is just a mini-doc called... Um, 
oh, sorry, Fortress City is what it's called. And it's about the changing face of London since mass terrorism happening more and more often because of mass immigration. And just the other day, I got caught up at Oxford Circus in a mass panic, thousands of people running through the street away from what they thought was a terrorist attack. Turns out it was only two people arguing in the street at Oxford uh, Circus Station. And people are so on edge, so afraid that they started screaming and running, thinking they were going to get shot, that they were going to get blown up. If that happened in Japan, if there were an argument, people would pull out their phones and they'd go film it. If that happened in Canada, people would maybe try to break up the fight and continue their day. But London it's this whole city is on edge. They've got barriers built up. Buckingham Palace even has these disgusting giant yellow gates to stop a giant truck from ramming through it. And this is unlike anything we have reference to in history. This is a battle within the gates and they are inviting the enemy in. Uh, it's absolute insanity. And the all you have to do, I guess, is look to Israel really for what the future of European cities are going to be. It's really, really interesting. I, I, I lived there all through the 90s. It was a tremendously safe city, even though we were going through a bombing campaign from the IRA. The IRA would call people mm -hmm. to warn them before the bomb went off so Precisely. nobody got hurt. Lauren, thank you very much for coming on. I'm out of time, but I hope you'll come back and talk again. Really uh, interesting to hear where you're coming from, and I look forward to seeing the film.